Hello. Um, I'm going to show you a set of experiences, and I want you to just think about what they have in common. So going to a concert or actually playing the guitar, rock climbing, playing a video game, intense game of chess, uh, maybe you're a DJ. This could be anything, but I'll just say it's a programmer working on a really intense problem or maybe a design problem, going to IMAX, snowboarding. So think about this for a second. What do those experiences have in common? They take you to another world, or they have the potential to take you to another world, a special world, a transformative world where the rules are a little bit different. And in game development, we often call that the magic circle. And the real issue is that people step from their ordinary world into this special transformative world for some period of time. In the story archetype that you're all familiar with, every blockbuster ever written, the hero's journey, same thing. Our hero starts out in his ordinary world, and then at some point he steps into this special or extraordinary world. Now, these changes are both in the moment, while you're actually having that experience, but a lot of these things have the ability to change us permanently, or actually change the world permanently, and we'll talk about that. Now, look at these experiences. So imagine that this guy is trying to figure out, why is this menu item gray? Why can't I choose it right now? <laughs> He's trying to walk through really complicated camera menus, and he really just wants to take a picture. Studying your user manual, tech support with a baby, and every meeting ever held. <laughs> so are these transformative? Do they take you to a special, extraordinary world? No. So we tend to think about this as binary. There's typical user experience, and then there's extraordinary, transformative user experiences. But what if we could actually bring those together? And it would be really cool if we could, but even if we can't do that, even just moving it just a little bit can make a difference. So it's not binary, it's a continuum. Everything we do makes a difference. Now, but this is the cool part, is that we can also bring some of the extraordinary world into the user's ordinary, typical life. And it doesn't matter what the product is. It doesn't matter how simple it is, it doesn't matter what it is. We have the chance to do that. In fact, every experience has the potential to be transformative. Now, we think about things like this, right? Rock climbing, if you don't go into the special world of rock climbing world, you'll die. So you're in that world. You're very focused. So we all accept that. But we don't realize, until you're in it, some of you may have taken a plane here, and you may have actually done a Sudoku puzzle. So even something as simple as that is enough to cause that transformative experience, at least the in-the-moment experience. So we shouldn't always be thinking that these experiences are only for the big things, like obvious things, video games, sports, things like that. It can be the tiniest thing. Now, uh, you can imagine that whatever your product is, think about what the user is doing, and as ridiculous as this might sound for a lot of products, Imagine that you added world to the end of it, right? So time tracker world. The person enters the world of time tracking. Now, that could be a terrible, horrible world, or it could be a great world. So this is a product that I've just started recently using. It's called IntelliJ by JetBrains, because I've taken a long break from programming, and I just got back to it. So this is a... Um, an integrated design environment, so this is, uh, or development environment. So this is a tool that's meant to help me be in code world more often, because it's doing more things for me, so that I can just pay attention to the code, not uh, pay attention to all the frustrating little things that get in the way of me actually making the code do the thing that I want to do. And this is actually a really cool product. So this is code world, and their goal, if they do everything right, is to take me into this transformative code world. And when I'm actually in code world, if they're doing the right thing, this is how I feel. <laughs> now, code worlds can also be completely horrible, <laughs> where I don't feel like a superhero. I feel like a scared kitten, except a big kitten would be awesome, but I feel like a little kitten. So how you actually construct those experiences 
really, really matters. And you have the chance to craft an extraordinary world for your users in very simple ways. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So last time on, at uh, Mind the Product in London, how many of you were there? Well, a few people. OK. Um, I talked about how to save cognitive resources, how to spare the user's cognitive resources wherever possible. This time, I'm going to talk about where to spend them. So I'm just going to do a real tiny, quick review of only a small piece of that. The video, if you haven't seen it, the videos from Mind the Product are online and free, so I urge you to take advantage of it. But since Mind the Product is sort of ongoing learning, I didn't want to just say the same thing that I've already said on video. So the goal was to reduce cognitive leaks. And it wasn't so much don't make me think, it was don't make me think about the wrong things. So a leak is anything that takes cycles. Anything that causes you to just drain the tiniest bit of cognitive resources. So we don't want to waste them because they are scarce and they are precious. The person needs them to have a better life. And they also need them to try to get better at the thing our product is helping them do. So this is a great book. I'm sure that most of you have read it. If you haven't, everyone should read it. It's old and out of date. And it's the, the best possible treatment, um, understanding of what it's like for users. And when this book first came out long, long ago, I kept thinking, everything is going to change now. And finally, the designers and engineers will understand what it's like to be us, users of a uh, you know, shower uh, faucets in a hotel. But uh, things haven't changed. In fact, they've gotten sometimes worse. So little pop quiz. This is, I'm going to review just this little part of that talk because this is my favorite part. So which of these causes more cognitive leaks? Oh, how many A? How many say B? OK, yes, it's B. Now, A can look really overwhelming, but the point was everything that you need to use it is already in the product. It's in the world, so it doesn't have to be in your head. So that was one of the things that Don Norman really popularized was this idea of there could be knowledge in the world or knowledge in the head, and we have to figure out where is the best place for it. So the more knowledge that's in the world, the easier it is to use that product. With the second one, when the knowledge is, has to be in your head, you have to consult a manual. The thing has all sorts of modes, um, you know, but it's very sleek. So, um, this is another classic one. This, you know, this is your stovetop burners. And this is a concept called mapping, because you get to play the game of which one controls which burner. Now, we normally think, well, that's not really much of a problem, right? But this, of course, would have made a big difference, because the dials are mapped to the actual thing they're controlling. Right? And you've seen this. You've probably been in a car where you lift up to send something down when they could have just switched it, right? So it's not a natural mapping. Now, that requires knowledge in the head because it's not really in the world. Now, they could do things like this, actually have little you know, controls. And a lot of times, they will give you letters, like it'll say which one it controls. But you still have to do a transformation in your brain. Now, these seem like simple things, but these tiny little things all over the place add up. And this, this is true. And this is the worst example of mapping that I can. True. I, I thought it wasn't true, but it actually is. So, so no, things have not gotten better. They've gotten worse. So death by a thousand cognitive micro leaks. So the tiny things add up. They add up in a person's life. Um, so the point is to fix those wherever we can so that they can actually use them for better things. And part of those better things, I've talked a lot about how those better things include the other real parts of their life, but also using our product to do something to actually improve and get better. So this transformative world, what are the attributes of this transformative world? So we think of things like flow and high res. I'm going to talk about flow in a little bit. This intense focus, this is what people report. So you've probably heard me talk about this before or seen this. Um, flow takes you to that extraordinary world. That's the experience you have in the moment. High res. Um, is where the extraordinary world starts to become part of your normal life. And there's another thing that people report, which is that they have this feeling of enhanced aliveness. They feel more alive, more human, more like a person. So you've experienced this. You're listening to music. 
And the next thing you know, you imagine yourself doing that. Now, if you really understand classical music, you have higher resolution for classical music, so you actually think that you know which um, you know, uh, instruments in the orchestra you're talking to. Now, a lot of you may not have done that, but I swear every one of you has at least played air guitar while you were listening to a song. And if you, or maybe keyboards or drums, and if you did that, it meant that you had a perception of those instruments. And you might have completely sucked at it, but you were there, you, you heard it. Part of your world was made more high resolution by the experience of that music. So to craft an extraordinary world, first thing we want to do is just always think about making them feel like an actual human being. So they want to feel more alive. We want to treat them like a human being. Now, UI elements have a lot to do with this. There are a lot of things that you can do to make your user interface feel more lively. I'm not going to talk about that um, because uh, there's a lot of treatment of that online, things that you can find, resources. Most of your um, user interface designers will do that. Now, some of that, not all of that is positive, right? There's a big emphasis on animation, and animation can be great because living things move, they're animated. <coughs> but, oh, sorry, I just coughed into the microphone. So, um, the user experience also needs to help you feel more alive. And then the post UX UX, which is what we're really designing for, we're designing for what happens after what happens happens. When they step away from the experience, how are they changed? What do they have to show for it? What do they say about it? All of that. That's what we're really building for. That's where high resolution comes in. Now, should a product feel alive? And this is controversial, but it doesn't matter because humans anthropomorphize everything. We project human attributes onto inanimate objects, onto things, onto, especially onto pets, right? So how to tell if your cat is plotting to kill you. And in fact, I love Google Poetics, where you type something, you start to type something into Google, and you see what Google thinks is the most likely thing you're going to say next. My cat is trying to kill me. <laughs> right? But it keeps going. My car is, now, it's not the first, it's the second. First, it's to start trying to start trying, right? In other words, it wants to, but it's trying to kill me. My TV is trying to kill us. And you, <laughs> not me. And my computer, of course, is trying to kill me, but my favorite is it's trying to open everything with Windows Media Player. <laughs> it really wants to do that. So these are human attributes, right? Your computer's not trying to do anything, right? But we really anthropomorphize computers. Now, there's some people who've tested this. Right? This is a very old book called The Media Equation. It's kind of awesome, though. Byron Rees and Clifford Nass, Nass, they did a lot of work at Stanford. They did a series of, this was pretty old, they did a series of sociology experiments. Classic sociology experiments where the people were people. And then they said, what would happen if we took one of the people and then replaced them with the computer? How would that experience change for the other person who's still a person? And they found something kind of amazing and kind of creepy. And one of the classic ones, you've probably heard this one, is they had people go in and take like a little training course or something on a computer. Then some of the people, after they were done, were asked to then rate their experience with that program. But another group of people went through the same program, and then they were moved to another computer to say how they felt about that experience on that computer. They didn't want to hurt the computer's feelings, so these people gave it a more honest review. These people kind of rounded up. <laughs> so they thought, wow, they don't want to hurt that computer's feelings. Now, this is, of course, not conscious. And we also know things like conversational language causes people to pay more attention than dry academic language, even if it's completely understandable. And, of course, we all know this intuitively. And one of the theories for why this is is because when you're reading something, even in a book, with conversational language, the brain kicks into, I'm having a conversation mode, so I better pay attention to hold up my end. So there's some very compelling reasons why we do this. Now, that same research gave us Clippy. So it's not always a net gain. But, um, so you can't, you can't apply all of the research, literally. Now, the answer to this, by the way, is yes. It's always yes. Your cat is... When they're needing, they're just testing your internal organs. So um, <laughs> it's a great book. So, uh, and you'll rethink cats if you read it. So we want to interact with things that make us feel more human. But of course, this is what we typically do. 
we imagine that this is our user. Just, he's happy, his life is perfect, he has the right color balance in his house, everything is beautiful. <laughs> of course it's easy, everything is intuitive. Here he is with his credit card, ready to buy stuff, thanks to your product, because this is who that person is, right? So we treat our users like really creepy stock photo people. We assume that their life is not at all what their real life is, because this is not your user, that is your user. This is not your user, perfect guy with perfect baby. This is the guy who's having a conference call, watering his lawn, <laughs> forgot to put his pants on. This is your user. This is their life. So, and it's not that they struggle, it's that we don't let them know that struggling is completely appropriate. So they feel like there's something wrong. I'm not really alive. So, the problem is not that we give them the manual that's terrible. It's that we act like the manual is awesome and everybody else understands it, right? But the manual was written for this guy or these people. It's not written for real people. So we start to question because the company acts like everyone else is totally good with just this manual. So we could fix this in the product, right? But we're never going to make the perfect product. So I generally don't look at fixes in the product. Sure, there's things we should do and things we could do and things we want to do, but I'm always looking for things we can do right now. And, and again, we can never make the perfect product. So we can just tell them. We can just acknowledge it. We can just be honest. And I, oh, I should say, I won't name the company. I gave a, a similar advice to a very big company, huge, huge company. And afterwards, some of the people came up and they said, we would love to be that transparent, you know, but we, we can't. We can't do that. You know, we can't tell people it sucks. And I said, well, do you think there's anyone who doesn't know this already? Is, are you telling them anything new that it sucks? Yes, you actually are telling them something new. You're telling them that you get it, that you understand. And that's a very, very powerful tool to help motivate people and help make them feel more human. So acknowledge that they're human in everything that you do. Now, the trouble with FAQs, because people say, well, we have all these FAQs, is that they also were written for this guy who smiles and points to the screen all day long. So, not this guy. This is your user, right? So FAQs were not written for this guy, but they should be. Or they're written for this guy who knows exactly what to search for in help, right? If you've ever tried to actually get help in Microsoft Excel, it's stunningly hard to figure out what question you're even supposed to ask. So this is your user. He has no clue. Because if he knew what the problem was, and he knew what it was called, he could look it up. But he doesn't know. So he doesn't even know where to start. So instead of FAQs, we could add FEEs or FFTs. So frequently experienced emotions. And I'm actually totally serious. I mean, you could have a place on your website where you have FAQs, and then you have, here's what you're probably feeling, right? And then um, frequently, frequently felt things, something like that. So does your UI, your marketing, your support, your product, does it acknowledge what people are actually feeling as a human being, or is it just listing facts? So think about what they're feeling at the moment they're experiencing this. And you could just add a button. <laughs> and in fact, someone actually took that advice, which is this company called Wasabi, or a product called Wasabi. It doesn't exist anymore, but not because they did this. So <laughs> they added an I'm freaking out button to the screen. It was a, a personal financial management thing. And they said that um, so many people reported that the I'm freaking out button was the most encouraging thing that they had ever seen because they generally were freaking out. And the fact that there was a button, it didn't matter if the button didn't do anything, it said, yes, it's normal to freak out. It's so normal, there's a button. So think about what you do. Um, the Kindle Fire has this thing, which I think is called Mayday. I still have the old Kindle. And that people could just click and get help right there. And, and the fact that it's called Mayday, it's like, oh my god, help, I'm drowning, right? So, Amazon said that um, it's hugely successful, and apparently people do all sorts of things with the, with the customer service that they get um, in real time for the Kindle. They have people, you know, sing happy birthday to their boyfriends and draw things and do other things for them, but it's been very successful. So just the fact, and again, it's not that it says, um, you know, 
click here for customer support, it actually shows you that you are drowning and you, you need a, some, a life preserver. So the way that you portray the person's ability to get help can reflect how they feel when they're doing that. So think about it. <laughs> now, I'm of course serious about this, and I've done something very much like this in my own books, uh, or in my own programming books. But you can, I mean, you can soften it. So to craft an extraordinary world, the first thing we're going to do is just always be thinking, they want to feel more human, what can we do to keep acknowledging that they're human and acknowledging that we know that they're human. So let them know in everything that you do. Now, next thing to craft an extraordinary world is help them find flow through challenge. And um, I, probably a lot of you are familiar with flow. This, when I first went to work as a game designer, which was a very long time ago, this was the book that we all had to start with. And um, the, the subtitle, The Flow, is The Psychology of Optimal Experience. And Csikszentmihalyi, which you should be impressed that I can actually say that, but it even gives a, a way to, ex to say his name in the book. Um, Csikszentmihalyi, he said, um, he did this long study, very in-depth, of the experiences that people have, and w when they're feeling this state they call optimal experience, and what helps to cause it. And these attributes, because you've all experienced this a lot, it's total focus. The worries of the world just drop away. Sometimes we call it people who are in their zone, they're in their element, right? It's not the same as zoning out. It's totally focused and engaged, and people report that as some of the happiest experiences of their life. And part of it is, for a time, they get to forget about everything else that's going on. And it's very much a feeling of aliveness. So we expect to feel it in things like this, that sense. Now here, people look at this and they go, well, he doesn't look like he's actually having fun. And this is where it's a mistake to associate flow with fun. It's total focus and engagement. And when people think of flow and these transformative experiences as fun, then they either think, well, we have to be making a game, or the worst possible thing, which is, I'm just going to say it, gamification. So um, there's some aspects of gamification that people talk about that are OK. But the idea that we're just going to make it into a game, we're going to put points and you know, badges, whatever, the, um, that's completely misunderstanding the heart of game design, which is flow. Because chess, or Go, if you go back to one of the most ancient games, which is still popular, um, this guy's not necessarily having fun in the way that we think of it. And he's worried, but he's, he's worried about the next move. He's not at all worried about what's going on in his life. So it's a deeply um, enriching experience. So one of the things he found was that it's about a balance between challenge and ability. And if you get too far out of balance, you either get boredom or you get frustration, and then you just give up. So we have to have challenge. And there's a block to challenge, which is really sort of the, the ease of use police, I, I might call them. These people are very well intended, I used to be one of them, who just thinks everything should be easy. It should just be easy. And this is, uh, and this is something I hear a lot, because I talk about how to write user manuals. And often I will see people tweet, well, if you have to have a manual, your product already failed. So your product it should be so good it doesn't need a manual. That's just nonsense, right? That's like saying, well, it, you know, if your brain surgeon was good enough, he shouldn't have had to read any books. So, I mean, it, some things are just hard and complex, and they should be, because if it doesn't have a manual, it might not be very interesting, and it might not have any opportunities for flow. So if you want them to read the frickin' manual, you could just make a better one. But um, <laughs> just, just a thought. So the point with the ease of use advocates is that um, they get stuck here, don't make me think. When it's supposed to be, don't make me think about the wrong things. It's not don't make me think at all. Because without challenge, there's no flow. So we need to think about making this distinction. And cognitive leaks is not the same as cognitive challenges. We should close the leaks so that they can focus on the challenge. Now, a lot of people say, well, my product isn't challenging. It's this really incredibly simple thing. But even the simplest things. Um, have the potential to be part of a bigger context. And you may have heard me talk about this before. Quick refresher on the distinction between the tool, which is what you make, and the context, which is what the user is actually trying to do, or what it enables for them by having it, or what would be missing if they didn't have it. So 
Tool versus context, this is you, this is your competitor, or maybe the relative sizes are reversed. But none of that matters, because what matters is this bigger context in which you exist, in which your product is supporting. Because the context is where all the cool stuff is happening. So what you make is the tool, what they're using it for is the context, and you can expand that out as far as you want. And that's where sustained, uh, sustained success really lives. And that's where the challenge lives. But of course, this is the slide I show everywhere and probably will for the rest of my life. Because this is how we treat users. Before they give us a lot of money, we're all about the context. It's beautiful, these amazing things you're going to do. And then they fall through the trapdoor into the boiler room after they give us the money, and they're left with the manual, which is just about the tool. So there's a huge disconnect there. You guys are the people who actually have a lot to say about changing this reality. So, the tool UI, of course, should be as easy as possible, but no easier, so that the context can be hard, so that we're focusing on the right things. If I'm editing video, I want to think about, is this the right place in my video to make an L cut? I don't want to think about, how do I actually tell the computer to do it? Screw it, I'm not even going to do it. I'll just do a normal jump cut, which is horrible. So um, we need to be focusing on the story we want to tell when we're video editing, not which menu item to choose or which button to push. So without challenge, there's no Flow, without flow, we're really missing the opportunity for the extraordinary world. But the flow lives in um, the context, not necessarily our tool. So this is not how we want to think about our product at all. Now, it is how we want to think about the specific UI, because the way to have an extraordinary experience is if the UI starts to just disappear. That doesn't mean that you don't see it. It means that you're not having to drain cycles thinking about it. You're thinking more about what you're actually trying to do than using the tool. Because that's not our user's ultimate goal, is to be awesome at the tool. So this is not how we want to think of our users. And, and sometimes that's what this whole ease of use um, uh, you know, advocate can actually uh, try to treat the user like they're just a little kid with no capabilities at all. And that's wrong. Because who do they want to be in an extraordinary world? Right? When you step into that extraordinary world, you want to think of yourself as this guy, not that guy. You want to think of yourself as a Valkyrie. This is me when I'm in code world, right? Unless I'm a kitten. So I want to be a superhero. I don't want to be a baby. And that requires challenge. So to craft an extraordinary world, Help them think about the challenge within the context. Now, one of the ways that you can do that, oh, side effect. Oh, I forgot, I have a little demo for you. So, um, here's a side effect, a good side effect of focusing on context and not just the tool, is because context is where we have the ability to have higher end products and services. So, this is a little tool Let's see if I can get this to work. It's going to be the most annoying thing that you have really made. Well, not the most annoying thing you've ever heard, but pretty annoying. So this is called Horse Shaker. And that is literally all it does. I'll put this. Oh, I'm in tap mode. That's all it does. And I'm not kidding. That is all it does. But this is the real description. But you're wondering how I even know about it, right? And it's 99 cents, okay, horse shaker. 99 cents. These, on the other hand, are photography-related apps. So, higher price tags. These are related to photography, horse shaker. You literally shake it to get horse sounds. So, you're wondering what the connection is. And it's because the reason that I know about this is because I belong to several horse photography groups. And they all have figured out this is the most awesome thing to get what every photographer wants when they're shooting a horse, which is the ears forward. They want the horse to pay attention. So that 99 cent tool is being used by all sorts of horse photographers. Well, let's just pretend that we're going to actually turn this into a higher end product. Right? So first we're going to change the description. Ears forward audio, which should say patent pending or something. But anyway, so here we've got this. We could maybe put in a little code for you know, depth of field calculators or something like that. So maybe two days more programming, and we're going to call it horse shooter. No, wrong thing. Equine photographer. <laughs> By the way, that's my horse. So, um, and we got to change the price, because now 
It's a photography related tool. A couple more days of code, change the positioning. So this is the most extreme example of where you take something. I just have to do this again. So where you take something, and when you look at it in a bigger context, this is also an example where I'm pretty sure these developers have no idea how this is being used. And they're like, wow, sales are going up. Let's make, and they did, cow shaker and pig shaker and shaker. Shake. <laughs> so I'm not kidding you. You can, you can get the bundle. So tool versus context. So remember, the best challenges live in the context, not the tool. So to craft an extraordinary world, we need to have that challenge. One of the ways that we can help them experience these challenges or even know that there are challenges is to just help them discover what's possible. When you enter a world, for example, in a game, first thing you try to figure out is, what are the rules here? What is this world like? What can I do? What's the physics of this world? What's possible? So if you think of your product as an extraordinary experience, they've stepped into the world of you know, code world or time tracker world, whatever it is, then you want to think, all right, do they know what's possible? Can they explore what's possible? So imagine that the person is always asking, what can I do in this world? And there are some very simple ways to do it, which I'm sure a lot of you do. You could put this in the product, you could put this you know, on your website, whatever, tip of the day. This is IntelliJ again, this is their tip of the day. And I really depend on this, because it's a very overwhelming product. So tip of the day is a great way showing as many user examples as you possibly can. And I don't mean testimonials, like how, because testimonials are typically how awesome we are as the developers of this product. I mean, here's how awesome these users are. Here's what they've done. So what's possible? And you want to be able to focus on what's possible in the context, not just what you can do in the tool. So another problem is that we need to help people get back to the extraordinary world as often as possible, as quickly as possible, when they're in the experience. So we want them to keep moving forward, building skills, building challenge, building skills, building challenge. But this happens when they reach a certain point, and now this assumes they're still using it. They reach a certain point where it takes so long to remember where they were when they last were using the product that they never really get to make very much progress. And this doesn't apply to every product, but think about the context. So in code world, for example, you know, there's not always a natural stopping point. So when I'm just, okay, I'm done for the night, I can't go on, I leave myself little notes. These are different from normal code comments, which, are, which you hope will stay, which are expressing what the code is actually doing. This is me going, oh my god, this is what's wrong now. This is what I have to fix tomorrow. So I leave these things called tomorrow fix notes all over the place. Um, this one has said tomorrow for like two weeks. But so um, how can you help people regain their place? Well, Hollywood has an answer, and it's previously on. They help you get back to the world as quickly as possible by taking you through where you last were. Now, that's not the same as open to the last window, right? Open to the last window would just tell you you were watching the arrow. It doesn't tell you what happened before. A lot of products have history, and that's good, but that tells you um, what you actually did. It doesn't necessarily tell you what you were thinking while you were doing it. So we just need some way to do that. So Code World could do something like, and I'm not actually saying this is a good design decision, but for example, they could add another button on close that says make a reminder. And maybe it could just pull up a little sticky note or a little you know, journal entry that's specific to say, here's where I left off, because it's so crucial to helping me bootstrap my brain back into that world. Now, for all I know, this product actually has something like that, and I have no idea. But if there's a feature and you don't know about it, you know, it doesn't really exist. So if you can't change the product, no problem, because you can just tell people. And in fact, this, I think, is one of the most underused tools that we have for users, which is paper notebooks. And this. Um, these filled notes are like the coolest notebooks ever. Um, and you can have them customized. So you could even make you know, a, a, a where you were last journal to help people. And in fact, if you look up the context of your product, and then, don't do it now though, but, and, and then you um, look up journal or something after that, right? you will almost always, for any context, find people discussing the kinds of notebooks they make and how they do it. 
You know, there's pages and pages of people discussing their programming paper journals and what should go in it. So Field Notes is really awesome. They even have the, you know, you can geek out on that. So Code World, if you have previously on, that helps them enter the world more quickly, gets them back in more quickly. But it also helps them leave that world in a better way. Because if I know that I've done this, I feel better, my brain is off the hook, because it knows now that I'm going to feel better next time, I don't have to be worried about it. It's a very powerful tool. So it helps you leave that world. And here's another thing. I used to work in Hollywood. And of course, many of you probably know this, the thing they test most um, in movies is the ending. And we think, well, OK, because the ending is really important. But a big part of it is because the ending helps determine how people feel when they leave. And this is also why, so often, the best music is at the end. It's what you experience as you're leaving. So it's not enough to just think about how people enter our user experience. We should think about how they leave it each time. So think about what's your closing credits experience? How do they feel? Do you just boom, exit? Or do you have something that helps them feel better about it? And again, it doesn't have to be in the product, just things that you can talk about. And here's another problem. This is actually better than this, otherwise known as the upgrade. So this is what happens when people upgrade. They're, doing, they're working their way up, and then suddenly there's a crash. And one of the reasons we fear upgrades is because we might have worked very hard to get past the I suck at this threshold, and we're so afraid to go back. And I don't just mean upgrade the same product. I mean, it could be upgrade to another product, to another um, competitor's product. If you want someone to upgrade to your product from their existing product or a higher end product. But there is new research. Just read this. So, no, no, that's the wrong message. Okay, so, um, so think about upgrading to a higher end product because we always talk about switching costs. Right? What, what does it cost a, a user to switch to a new tool, to a new vendor, to whatever? But we're usually thinking about money, time, things like that. It's also just how much do they lose in terms of flow? How hard are they going to have to work to get back to those flow experiences? Now, you may never, ever hear this from people, because this, this is a psychological and often subconscious state that people experience. So you won't hear people say, well, I needed to spend more time in flow, and I didn't have the right focus, or, but this is what's happening. So how can we help people? And we can, of course, mind the gap. This is um, a camera I used to have, the Canon T2i. This, uh, this is the camera I have now, the 5D Mark III, which is way more camera than I need, but I use it to shoot horse videos, not photos. Now, here's the difference. First of all, the price, <laughs> huge difference. But the T2i, the more beginner camera, has those little buttons, which most of you are probably familiar with. Right? And, and it, they're, little, they're little automated things that where you just click on it and boom, you're right into the correct settings for whatever that is to optimize for whether you're shooting you know, close-ups or portraits or landscapes, or in my case, sports. And this camera doesn't have that. Now, it has these, which are things that you can actually do pre-settings. So I could just switch right over to A setting or B setting or C setting. First, I have to remember what was ABC. But here's the problem that I had, is that I've been shooting manual for a very long time. So that part's not a problem for me. But the problem is, when I um, wanted to use those was when I'm sitting inside the house, and all of a sudden the horses run by, and they're doing something completely insane, and I want to grab the camera and just take pictures. I don't want to uh, figure out my settings. I just want to go to sports mode. And it was awesome. And I tried so hard to research what was in that sports mode? What was it really doing? And tried to recreate it and never actually could. So I'm now having, in that one instance, which is important to me, a degraded experience. I didn't want Canon to add those buttons back in necessarily. You know, I'm now at the big girl camera. But they could have just said, oh, by the way, this is what you might want to do to optimize for these things. Or this is what we do in the automated settings that we use in these other cameras, because that's all I wanted. So think about how you can help people bridge that gap. Now, I, I, I can't say this enough, and in fact, I think I've already said it five times, but just tell them. It's so easy to do, and we don't do it. Now, this is really what we want to get to, is to think of our users as being on their own hero's journey. 
And again, they're not on a hero's journey to figure out our tool UI. But they're on a journey. To, they're using your tool for some reason. There's a context. And that context is what matters to them. And that's the context where they can be heroic. So they want to step from the ordinary world into the special world. And there's a lot of things that happen. Right now, this is my very, 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 very oversimplified version of the hero's journey. It's more complex than that. But life is normal, something changes, you freak out, refuse, then you step over the line, right? Then Frodo goes, okay, I'll do it. So, but look at this stage right here. That's where we want to play the role in the user's life, both as the product vendor, but also to hook them up with other resources and other people who can play that role, because this is the most crucial role. So we want to be this guy for our user, Aragorn. Aragorn with the horse is even better. Um, allies and sidekicks, that's okay. We don't have to be the mentor. We don't have to be the experts. A lot of people are building tools. Um, and and uh, well, like a lot of times we say you need to eat your own dog food, right? But literally, I don't think dog food companies actually make people eat their own dog food. You don't have to be a dog to create products for dogs. So there, there are ways to do things. But too often, this is the role we play in our user's life. Or this is what they think. They think this is the role we play when we want to be playing the mentor, or the allies, the sidekicks. Stormtroopers, this is a role they often see us in. But it would be OK if they were these guys, so Lego stormtroopers. But this is where we want to be with our users. Now, I'm, I'm going to have you really quick do, um, some of you probably know that I sometimes make you do awkward exercises. This is really low on the awkward scale. Um, it'll be very fast. But you'll have to do it, because doors are locked. You can't leave. You have to do it. So, um, so let me just explain it. <laughs> it'll take less than two minutes. I'll have you introduce yourself to someone. It has to be someone you don't know or you don't know very well that's very near to you in the seats, right? Because you, you won't even have to stand up for this really easy. Then I'm going to ask you to do something <laughs> with that person. And then for just a moment afterwards, you'll talk to that person. So I'm going to have you introduce yourself to the person. Then what I'm going to have you do, this is the critical part. This will be difficult for everyone. This is actually going to be the longest like 20 seconds of your life, is you have to stare intently at some piece of the person's clothing. So choose wisely and sensitively, <laughs> and only touch it if they give you permission. But if they say, you can touch it, because actually touching it would be a good thing for this exercise, which you have no idea why I'm doing it, but um, you will. So all the, so, and that's what you'll do. And for 20 seconds, I don't want you to talk about it. I want you to actually force yourself. So this is easier than making eye contact, right? Just stare at a piece of the, like, look at their sleeve or their jacket or something. Maybe their knee, right? You know what to avoid. So, um, and I want you to really see what you can see. Now, I asked to have the house lights up fairly well, so you can see. So I'm going to have you do that right now. Introduce yourself really quickly to one person, and then go into stare mode. So first, introduce yourself. <laughs> group. OK, time. Now, moment of silence while we stare. Just focus. No talking. Focus. You won't have the full experience unless you focus. Oh, you guys are awesome. Just stare. See what you notice. Look deeper. <laughs> keep looking. You can blink, but keep looking. You don't have to actually freeze your whole body. <laughs> you just have to stare. <laughs> this is the most amazing stop frame. So anyway, keep looking. See what you notice. Notice something that you didn't see before. Keep looking. Keep looking. OK, now tell the person something that you noticed. Tell the person something you noticed. No, I mean about the actual thing. <laughs> about the th
Okay, I'm gonna stop you. I'm gonna stop you. You were amazing. Now, so you just had a little tiny trip into, I don't know, we'll call it fabric world. Okay, that, this could actually be a burden that I've just given you higher resolution in that world, just that tiny little experience. Now, you weren't in the flow state or anything like that, but honestly, you've been changed in some way by that experience. Maybe not the way I attended, but you've been changed in some way by that experience. So for the rest of the conference, you will creepily notice more about people's clothing. <laughs> but, you, but you had a little taste of what it feels like. What, well, some of you, I'm sure, are artists or photographers, people who have learned to develop an eye for light and shading and textures and things like that. So you just had a moment of experiencing that, and it only took a few seconds looking at someone's sleeve. So really think about what it means to help someone move into the um, extraordinary world and take some of that extraordinary world back out. And never think that your product doesn't have the opportunity to do that, because everything, everything does. And think about the role you play. So our job is to craft an extraordinary experience and to help our users be this guy, not that guy. I want to be a Valkyrie, not a kitten. But if I'm going to be a kitten, I want to be a really big kitten or like a badass kitten. <laughs> a superhero, I want to be a superhero, not a baby. But if I'm going to be a baby, it's going to be this baby. So <laughs> this is how you want to see your users. And you want to help them find that world. Think about how lucky we are to be in this business where we really do have this powerful influence, which is why you're all here, this powerful influence on people's lives, and in powerful ways and in very, very subtle ways, but the subtle ways are really important too. And thank you so much for spending some of your cognitive resources on me. I appreciate it.